Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning and good afternoon from wherever you are. It's a great pleasure to welcome you here to this uh, information session on knowledge brokering. I'm Lisa McNamara, and I'm the Director of Knowledge and Global Engagement for the Climate and Development Knowledge Network, CDKN. And if you're less familiar with CDKN, it's we're a, a global Southern-led network, a program that's been operating since 2010, and we work in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, and we really focus on processes to move knowledge into climate action, and over the last, really trying to on our lessons on knowledge brokering and the culmination of that is also is, is what we're going to share with you here today. We're just going to share some of the insights and reflections and lessons that we've gathered. And the process has been led by Lucia Scordinibio, my colleague, who's the learning advisor for CDKN. And yeah, we really welcome you here today and look forward to this session. And we're just going to have a, a presentation that Lucia is going to do, and then we're going to follow that with Q&A. So quite a simple session. And please feel free to share any questions that you may have in the chat as we go along. And then after the presentation, we'll have a, a Q&A and a discussion, and then we'll close. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to, to Lucia. Great, uh, thank you, Lisa. And uh, let me actually stop sharing the the screen for a moment uh, because uh, we'd like to uh, to start with a, a chat shower. So um, I don't know how many of you know the the concept, but uh, what it means is that uh, you can all open your chat box and. Uh, we would like to hear from you what comes to mind when you uh, hear the word knowledge brokering or when you think about the concept of knowledge brokering. So if you could all type that in your chat box, but please don't press send yet. We want it to, to really be a shower so that uh, at uh, in about 30 seconds or so, I will uh, I will give you the go to, uh, to post what you think about uh, uh, the concept knowledge brokering, and then we can just see what, uh, yeah, what is our collective understanding of this uh, this term and concept that uh, is what is uh, bringing us all together today. So I'll give you a few more seconds, let's say 10 seconds to, uh, to just write what comes to mind immediately when you think of knowledge brokering. And if uh, you are ready, please do press enter so that we can uh, have a nice shower of, uh, of knowledge brokering. Oh, I saw very quickly a uh, heroes. <laughs> Wild West snake. Oh, uh, it really is a shower. <laughs> it's quite difficult to keep up with, the, with all the results coming in. But uh, let me just uh, go to the top and see what... Uh, what I hear, the process of producing and disseminating knowledge and research, that sounds like a, a good used definition for sure of knowledge brokering. I did like the, the heroes offering knowledge in exchange of its concrete use, the concept of facilitation, that's a, definitely a role that, uh, that knowledge brokers take. Listening and co-learning, lovely building bridges, also something that we hear about very often uh, Knowledge brokers are these uh, builders of bridges, uh, linking knowledge users and producers, uh, simplicity and understanding, dialogue. Um, Chris, uh, our uh, old uh, CDKN friend is uh, always uh, looking for something <laughs> controversial, Wild West uh, snake oil salesperson. <laughs> um, Opening the knowledge policy practice interface. Uh, very nice, uh, Laurent. Um, synthesis and learning, connection. Uh, that is also definitely something that knowledge brokers do. Uh, creating relationships, uh, definitely also a very important role. Uh, An exchange for knowledge. Uh, someone who sits between researchers and recipients, uh, definitely. 
um, knowledge sharing, information management. This is great. Uh, I think it's uh, it's definitely all of this, uh, as you will uh, will hear now in the presentation that uh, I'll take you through. So perhaps it's a, it's a good moment to start. But thank you very much for for all your contributions. And uh, let me go back to to screen sharing. As Lisa said, we're going to be discussing. Um, a little bit of some of the lessons that we have learned as we have worked on, on knowledge brokering and uh, reflecting on the process of knowledge brokering uh, over the past three years, although CDCAN's work in knowledge brokering has been much longer. So um, let me start by uh, a note perhaps on, uh, on terminology. Uh, the word brokering, uh, that is uh, the word that we have been using, is, uh, is actually something that is not perhaps always ideal. Sometimes we see that uh, people's perception of knowledge brokering is, um, and of the specific word brokering is, uh, is quite bad because of a financial transaction that often happens as brokers, for example, estate brokers, stock brokers, insurance brokers, uh, are these uh, middle person between a buyer and a seller. So definitely in CDCAN, that is not how we're thinking about it. There is no financial transaction. And we have used the, one of the definitions that uh, all of, also one of you put in, a, in our chat box. So there are these links between producers and users of knowledge to strengthen the generation, dissemination, and eventual use of that knowledge. So with CDCAN, we started like our reflection processes using this definition. It has now evolved, and that is a process that I will take you through in this presentation. So we also started with using this spectrum that comes from originally Harvey and Shackson. And here you can see the variety of roles that knowledge brokers take. So, for example, on the left hand side of the spectrum, we see that they can be intermediaries. Here they're really filtering information, helping to make it more accessible and available. So you may think of a climate portal as a typical example of, uh, of this information mediation process. When we go a bit further along the spectrum, knowledge translators are more summarizing, synthesizing the knowledge. They are uh, tailoring it to, to context, making it relevant, uh, credible. So here there is an additional layer of, um, of synthesis and tailoring and translation that is very important. When we go in the middle of the spectrum, the, the knowledge co-creator plays an important role in connecting stakeholders, bringing together diverse types of knowledge so that a process of co-creation and co-production can take place. They, um, they facilitate, they network, they strengthen capacities. So definitely a lot of what you talked about in the chat box is included in this knowledge co-creation process. When we go all the way to the right, innovation brokers are going even one step further. Here they're dealing with the bigger system. They're seeking to reorganize technical or social or institutional relationships. They are dealing with systemic barriers like power dynamics or patriarchal norms, fragmentation between sectors or levels. So they're definitely trying to bridge these divides at, at multiple levels and scales and sectors and so on. So um, of course, this the, the boundaries between these different categories are not so clear cut. There is a lot of overlap. And this is a process. But uh, this uh, we have found to be a very useful way of just understanding the breadth of activities uh, that, uh, that knowledge brokers undertake. So um, we also have heard about climate knowledge brokers, or maybe you also have. And this manifesto was uh, uh, put together in uh, about 2015. And here they define climate knowledge brokers as those who broker the transfer of knowledge related to the climate from uh, a person or organization to another via the medium of information. So when we read this definition, we definitely can see that it's mostly referring to the left-hand side of the spectrum. And um, however, we also know that uh, we are in a current uh, crisis, uh, the climate crisis. Uh, and if we even just think of what uh, happened with the, um, with the IPCC, what they told us last year, we see that uh, 
there is a, a real need to act uh, soon. A further delay in concerted global action will miss this window of opportunity that we have at the moment. We see that climate change intersects with many other problems like and challenges like unsustainable resource use, habitat destruction. If we go to the very local level, we have climate sensitive livelihoods, poverty. We have a number of governance challenges like pertaining to leadership, funding, accountability, and trust. So what this means is that uh, the climate uh, challenge calls knowledge brokers to actually act in very specific ways. And what we see here is that they're really saying that the gap between what is needed and the adaptation action required is currently too big. So we really need to focus on this adaptation action. So. What that means for knowledge brokers is, uh, is um, a number of things. So you can see here, we have uh, this, uh, this framework that we have uh, learned from with the colleagues uh, from, from CSIRO originally, and that really shows this journey from information to action. And the fact that if we need to focus on adaptation action, we must uh, overcome a number of, uh, of hurdles and, and challenges along the way. So. Um, I will now go through through these different steps and to really see what knowledge brokers need to do for action to take place. So to start at the, the first um, level, we first have to understand the difference between information and knowledge. So these are, in fact, indeed different. And uh, knowledge is something that is more internalized. It's quite different from information. So one acquires information and through a number of uh, of processes, it becomes knowledge and therefore it becomes internalized in one's own. So those uh, cover, for example, issues of comprehension. So when we are thinking about uh, translating knowledge to, or translating information to, to become more useful for our target audiences, let's say, we have to think about issues like language and jargon and syntax. We need to think about the their context so that, um, yeah, it is relevant to their context. It means it gets internalized to their, their own context of the, of the people that we are working with. And we also need to think about how they value particular things. So, so the knowledge will become ours if we find it useful and important for, for our own needs, and therefore it is valued. We also see that um, the issues of credibility are important. So here, it's uh, it's not just a scientific adequacy. If we think of a farmer, uh, they probably will believe more in the, the rainmaker's uh, knowledge than in the scientists from a faraway university. So credibility is something very important to think about in relation to who we want to work with. Salience, once again, refers to the relevance and the legitimacy is more tied to the process through which the knowledge was, uh, was created, that it's perceived to be unbiased, fair, uh, considerate and respectful of different values and beliefs. So these are all issues that are very important when we are in the left-hand side of our spectrum and we're really thinking about knowledge translation. Um, we also have to think about which knowledge we're talking about. Uh, very often, I think knowledge brokering is thought of as uh, academic knowledge, uh, um, and that is translation to, to a more useful um, uh, format, let's say. But actually, we knowledge brokers need to think about much more wide-ranging types of knowledge. Uh, yes, the scientific, but also the practitioners, experiential, indigenous and local knowledge, because all of those uh, bring uh, a lot of value. And so what that means is that um, knowledge brokers play a crucial role in bringing together these diverse types of knowledge uh, that may be from different sectors and disciplines uh, or uh, types of stakeholders, but also creating safe spaces for all of them to, to understand each other to uh, and to then be able to create a, a new type of knowledge which is uh, more shared across uh, this diversity of, uh, of actors. But it's also understanding that there will be perhaps when we come in hierarchies and conflict. So that is all very important to think about for, for a knowledge broker. Um, 
However, knowledge is not everything. Like we also have to, to go beyond that. And this takes us to, to the next uh, step, which is uh, moving from, uh, from knowledge to decisions. And um, we can see in this uh, framework, the knowledge rules and values framework from Goddard et al, that uh, not, when we want to result in evidence-based decisions, knowledge is just one of three factors. Uh, rules and values are also very relevant. So what that means uh, in terms of rules is uh, not just formal rules uh, like regulations and laws and and treaties and so on, but also informal rules that may be cultural norms, taboos, behaviors, and all of these will affect whether a change in decision can take place, just like values do. Because um, when we think about what our, um, either the people that we're trying to influence or the stakeholders that we're working with, when we consider what they deem important, worth and useful, that will have a huge role in determining whether a change in a decision can take place. If they do not value it, we may have the best knowledge, but it will not really result in a change. Politics, I don't think I really need to, to deter, like uh, define for you, but um, that also, as you, uh, I'm sure you all know, plays a very large role in uh, this process of, uh, of changing or influencing decisions. So, the knowledge, what it tells us is what the outcome could be, but then we must think about our stakeholders' values. Do they want the outcome? Are we allowed the outcome in terms of the rules that are in place? And do those in power want that outcome? So this just shows you like the, the process of, of going from knowledge to decisions and, uh, and the fact that there are many factors at play. Um, if you look also at this diagram, you will see how knowledge is one, again, small component in a much big, bigger uh, process, which involves different actors, institutions, processes, settings. So once again, it's just important for knowledge brokers to, to really consider this broader decision making and uh, systemic making or systemic context, let's say. So that is also something that uh, the IPCC recognized uh, last year. Uh, they talked about uh, this variety of actors that need to be involved, including marginalized groups, uh, uh, the need to, to reconcile these different interests, values, and worldviews at play. And um, so what this means, once again, for, for knowledge brokers is to really be able to understand these complex uh, governance dynamics, uh, cultural dynamics, uh, um, issues tied to like fragmentation or lack of coordination or power dynamics, uh, uh, differences in our stakeholders and what they value or, or the level of agency that they may or may not have, as all of that has a, a very large role in our process of influencing decisions and action. So, um, this is very important for knowledge brokers to, to consider this broader context. Um, of course, then from not decisions to action, there is a, another layer in which we have to consider whether there is motivation for action. So that is really tied to the political will and once again, to the values and interests at play, as well as capacities. So do we have the human and financial resources, uh, skills to enable the action to take place? So. Um, from there, I think you will really see that uh, the climate knowledge brokers definition on the left hand side of the spectrum is not really uh, adequate to what we need to do for adaptation action to, to happen. And knowledge brokers therefore really need to focus much more on this right hand side of the spectrum. Um, so what that means also is that we have reconsidered this definition of knowledge brokers in CDKN, and we now see them more as facilitators of change that seek to strengthen relationships and networks and understanding on the climate challenge, but it's really based on diverse types of knowledge so that we can result in a change in decisions and action. And that means that it's a process of navigating um, many different factors that go from politics to uh, networks or lack of networks and fragmentation, different values and goals and rules. So um, this is just a small summary that uh, shows uh, what we're expecting from knowledge brokers. 
And um, I just wanted to share a couple of examples of some of the lessons we have gathered in, in CDKN as we have tried to mainstream or see what the process of mainstreaming climate issues uh, really entails. So for example, one of the challenges that we saw uh, our partners often had is that stakeholders don't uh, necessarily appreciate the significance or urgency of climate change. So what that means then is that uh, we do have to provide uh, like uh, a critical mass of knowledge uh, in a tailored way, uh, uh, accessible. It also means that uh, we need to think about what our stakeholders uh, value. So, uh, for example, in Uganda, a study was undertaken during the, the first phase of CDKN in which uh, it, uh, there was an economic assessment of the impacts of climate change on different sectors, agriculture, water, energy. And what the study showed is that the cost of inaction on climate would be 20 to 24 times higher than the cost of action and adaptation. So that really caught the attention of the finance ministry because they could finally see that something was um, framed in their language, like financial terms. So that is also something very important for knowledge brokers to, to do, but they have to once again go beyond. For example, uh, we see that uh, there is a real need to have tools that can help us develop responses. So we, um, the Pani Chautari or Water Forum in Nepal, which also we have learned from, uh, really brought together in a multi-stakeholder setting, diverse uh, stakeholders, knowledge types uh, to discuss the uh, water, urban water challenges, and they developed uh, responses that were then piloted. Uh, they got together again in their multi-stakeholder setting to monitor, discuss, uh, identify new responses, but this really created the link to action as well. Uh, something else that is often faced as a challenge is that climate change is not high on the political agenda or part of institutional mandates. There are many priorities that are competing. So that means that we really have to look at uh, like how we can link uh, perhaps our message to a, a policy or vision and mission, if that is what we're trying to, to do, to achieve, uh, to influence and change uh, some of our, uh, uh, like for example, government, or it could be also non-governmental counterparts. Uh, if links are not so obvious, we have to be creative in finding those connections. So, for example, in India, our partners um, saw that the disaster risk management authorities were much more uh, decentralized from uh, national to state level to provincial city level. And therefore, they saw that their mandate was to strengthen capacity. So they decided to co-develop a, a capacity building toolkit with the disaster risk management authorities so that climate could be mainstreamed through their mechanisms and through their priorities. So that is what it means to think a little bit out of the, yeah, the traditional box. We have to, of course, therefore understand this governance landscape very well and be quite conversant with the a different field perhaps to our own and see how government activities may already be related to climate change. Sometimes retrofitting is possible. So it means uh, once again, looking much broader than what uh, we may do at times. Just the last example is often like climate issues are just seen as the Ministry of Environment's responsibilities, yet there is a lot of fragmentation. So what that means is that we can try to promote horizontal relationships between different departments. So in, uh, in Ethiopia, the a community of practice was formed um, in the past couple of years that brought together the Ministry of Gender, Finance, Environment to really talk about the climate gender nexus. And that has really helped to strengthen relationships between these different actors that normally would not talk to each other. But we may also do it through cross dialogues. It doesn't necessarily have to be so formalized, but the main thing is to try to see how to reduce this fragmentation that is there. So um, we have... Uh, many of our lessons written up already. We have three learning stories. Uh, I shared this, the example from Nepal and Uganda. There is a very good one as well from Namibia. We have a journal paper that is just about to be published. We are waiting to, to hear exactly when. Uh, we have just uh, released today an essential. So that is just a, 
a very brief document that says uh, who are knowledge brokers and what do they need to do during this uh, climate crisis, which ties very much to today's presentation. And we are thinking about some next steps around the strengthening capacities. Given all of these lessons, what is needed to um, strengthen the capacities of knowledge brokers, which skills may be needed. So in fact, we would like to take advantage of all of your collective views here to uh, um, share a, a form where you can uh, tell us what needs you feel and gaps are out there for uh, strengthening the capacities of knowledge brokers. So we'll put a, a link in the chat box so that you are uh, maybe able to contribute your views about uh, what you think should be included in a, in a capacity program. But um, from there, I think you can just uh, browse our website. We can also put in the link of, the, of this essentials and some of the other resources in the chat. But I'll stop here and, uh, and just wait to hear if there are any questions. Let me stop sharing so that we can see each other better, or I can see you rather. <laughs> Hi, Lucia. There is one question in the chat from, from Chris Gordon. He, he mentions that given with, that with any exchange of information between actors, there's a degree of uncertainty and misunderstanding and that the, there is an inherent uncertainty in the climate science messaging. And how do we avoid this uncertainty growing with multiple exchanges as this would erode trust? Okay, I um, I wonder what you mean, Chris, about the exchange of information. But maybe let me just answer, and then you can see whether you uh, you agree or want to come back with it. Uh, I think a lot of uh, what I hope has come through this presentation is that uh, um, I think there is a lot of value in multi-stakeholder processes to exchange information, to understand each other's points of views. And that also means then creating a collective understanding in which these discussions around uncertainty, uh, because of course uh, things are very uncertain with the with the climate challenge. Uh, I don't think we have the right answers, but that is where there is a lot of value of bringing together these diverse stakeholders, knowledge types, levels, sectors, because that can really help us to then create the shared understanding and perhaps. Uh, we may not overcome the uncertainty, but at least we create trust as we're all grappling with the same problem. So, I mean, this is just a very intuitive <laughs> way of answering. But uh, Chris, if you'd like to come in and say whether this makes sense and whether you actually were maybe referring to something else, I'm also happy to uh, try again. Yeah, th thanks, Lucia, and thanks for a very interesting presentation. And also the document you shared in the the link, which I've had a quick look at. The, the, the issue is that there, there are always um, difficulties in understanding between any two players at any one time, because the, the context they're coming with is slightly different. Now, when you're talking to a large, when I say large, maybe 20 people audience, you find that the information they're giving you and the information that you're giving them is always being interpreted slightly differently, not only with you, but also with all the other players in the audience. Now, when, you, when, when this goes back and forth and you're mathematically saying that you're getting, let's say 0 0.9 degree of understanding with each exchange, as you go along, there is a possibility that you get less and less understanding because you drift away in terms of the original thinking that you had. And then when you add on the fact that the climate models are saying different things, people are suspicious of scientists and things that they don't really understand, then you get the situation is, why can I believe you at all? So, one-on-one -on -one is much easier, but when you have a, a mixed audience, so we had a, the city can meetings we had, we tried to keep it as simple as possible. So we dealt with CSOs or we dealt with 
gender issues or you de dealt with the youth or with the media, even within each of these sort of subgroups, you find that the people have different understanding. And it's only when we put them into group sessions for them to argue it out themselves that we really, they really came to grips. But that was like peer-to-peer -peer education rather than the knowledge broker coming in. So I saw myself and my team very much as knowledge harvesters. Uh, and then we, you know, we, we sort of capture what the participants have discussed. And our role was more like a catalyst, a facilitator mm -hmm. to get the conversation going. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris. I think those are great. Uh, yeah, you've answered the, <laughs> the question, but uh, yeah, that's a great uh, contribution. And I totally agree. Knowledge brokers, I think, have to increasingly play this role of catalysts uh, rather than just bringing one type of information to the table. Um, and uh, I think also having exercises that help uh, uh, different viewpoints understand each other like there are a lot of uh, like games that say or tools that can be used just for people to place each other like themselves in each other's shoes I think that can really also help to at least see oh that's why it's happening it's because uh yeah, we just bring our own world views uh, and uh, understanding and then uh, I think the other aspect is also that uh, the aspect of strengthening capacity so I think that uh, again, a role of the knowledge broker is to help to strengthen capacities, but co-doing that with stakeholders. So how you said, like in small groups, peer learning, understanding from each other, uh, those are all the crucial functions. So yeah, thank you for bringing that. I see that there are a few more. Um, so... Jahin, he's saying, I believe that for a long time, local civil societies and NGOs have been playing a big role as knowledge brokers. Yes, and I think what's one of the things we've definitely been discovering in CDKN is that um, uh, as we've interacted with different people, they slowly recognize themselves as knowledge brokers, but then maybe they've never used this term. But I think it's a function that has been there and that is there and uh, is very widespread. It's just that we don't necessarily use the word knowledge broker, which may still be a little bit academic perhaps. Um, Lisa, I'm just continuing to read unless you have a, thank you. <laughs> yes, yes, I think, and I think just to say as well that in one context, you might be the knowledge broker, but in the other context, you might be doing more of the knowledge harvesting or the knowledge producing. So it, it's a continuum where you may play different roles all the time. Um, and it's it's just, it's useful to see, yeah, that that you you may be broker in one situation and not in another. But absolutely, mm. I think that it, once, once you look at this, once you look at the spectrum, you understand, oh, I've been doing this knowledge brokering the whole time <laughs> and I didn't know it. I think there was a, a comment from Megan Spires, a key piece of the puzzle has been connecting knowledge brokering with resource flows, both are needed for action to be taken, even if knowledge brokering is successful, without resources being human, financial and technology resources, action is hindered. Has CDCAN looked at this aspect? Mm. Um, I think that definitely ties to that last part uh, of the of the framework. Let's say where we're saying that yeah, for action to happen, you really need resources. Um, I think in our learning, we have uh, mostly looked at examples which did have resources, uh, um, whether from a project or whether um, well, I think most generally from yeah project resources, because it's true that otherwise. Uh, uh, it's difficult to sustain an activity without any, uh, yeah, any resources. Um, yeah, I see and that Bettina. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, please go ahead, Lisa, and then uh, you can. Uh, Just one, call. one, one comment that yeah, I think that there is a very important role sometimes as a matchmaker to connect um, actors with investors or like play mm. that matchmaking role in the resource flows so yeah there's different it's that is something that mm. we we do and see as part of the role of of a knowledge a knowledge broker 
Um, and then one thing that did come out of the learning quite strongly was that brokers that have been really effective have been able to have long-term processes where they build projects, funded projects, uh, one after the other, so that they, they, they're constantly looking for ways in which to to keep the resources flowing for their work and they use they 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 access those resources from multiple different channels um, and that's one capacity of a knowledge broker that's always yeah looking across the time horizon how how they can get support for different aspects and different parts of their their, their process essentially over time mm. Yeah, and maybe to add going even beyond thinking about projects, no? So really like it's a continuous flow of activities that uh, has to be sustained. And so I think uh, actually projects and funding cycles often uh, can even, they, on one hand, they can support, of course, knowledge brokering work, but sometimes can nearly hinder because we cannot uh, achieve certain things in specific timelines with specific log frames, uh, um, especially when we're talking about like long-term impact uh, and uh, uh, yeah, sustained relationships and trust over long periods of time. So those both take time to, to start off, but then also cannot be dropped just when a, a project ends. So it's crucial, the skill of knowledge brokers to be able to obtain these resources. But uh, Bettina, you had your hand up for a while. Sorry about that. <laughs> We're no, all going a, on. <laughs> this is a fascinating discussion. And I think really... Um, important and also I think linking to what Chris uh, was putting in the chat about uh, assumptions of uh, gatekeepers and agendas and tensions and dynamics around um, knowledge often being linked to funding and therefore linked to power so um, I wanted to flag this but my question is actually a different one and that is with all this complexity already and the experience that we have so how do we need to rejig things when we are working in a world and operating in a world where we are dealing a lot more with compound and cascading risk and actually an even more complex system than we have already been dealing with. So we're dealing with current situation of compound and cascading risk and we're dealing with future risk that might be really escalating far faster as we thought. Um, and there my question is here, you know, so how can effective knowledge management really be cognizant of it or possibly even responding or anticipating it? Maybe that's a bit of a bigger question, not just for Lucia, but for all of us really as a community of mm. practice. I was going to say that, uh, please, uh, I would love to see some other hands up and really get a, a sense of what everybody thinks, because I think this is a reason why we're here, no? all of us attending this call, because we are uh, concerned and we need to uh, achieve change. Uh, we are uh, yeah, in a very urgent moment in which uh, things need to be different. So it would be great if yeah, all of us are happy to share some, uh, some knowledge about that. Uh, I see that Nadia has um, uh, opened her camera. So maybe it's a, let me pass on the question to you in the meantime. <laughs> I can come in in a bit. <laughs> Oh, goodness, that's the danger of turning your camera on at the right, wrong moment. I was turning it on to, to just, I think that's such an important and really hard question. And I was going to add to that. And so not only with this, these high levels of complexity, but also, you know, our experience in with climate change information and also with COVID and just this moment of being kind of in this post-truth post um, where people have a huge distrust in, in governments, in science, in um, any form of kind of power that may operate in different spaces. And so there's, how do you balance that sense of urgency and need to act quickly with the, the, the more um, slower processes to build trust with the people that you are working in partnership with um, to understand the needs on the ground? Um, so I can't answer the question, but it was just adding, um, yeah, I guess another layer of complexity around um, yeah, the distrust in, in knowledge and science. Um, um, and I guess that's also um, understanding that, you know, knowledge is much more than just science um, and the difficulty with weaving in different kind of knowledge systems um, into processes um, where often in, in the kind of policy spaces, it's still kind of science that trumps in terms of decision making sometimes. No, indeed. Yeah. Thank you for, for that addition. But 
Yeah, once again, I my feeling, and I would love to hear more, uh, yeah, more input from uh, anybody else. But uh, it's really the importance of uh, having these uh, these processes that bring together different stakeholders and knowledge types, uh, um, and uh, yeah, that we uh, we can uh, at least surface these differences between them, whether they're uh, through the different like power hierarchies. Uh, um, but also find these collective answers together. So it's, yeah, it's definitely a process of, uh, and it's on one end, it's true that it's a slow process of trust building, uh, like in relationship building, and yet uh, that has to happen urgently, but uh, yeah, there are some starts uh, here and there, but uh, yeah, I think we, we really do have a lot to, to learn, but um I wonder if um, there are any other inputs. Uh, it would be nice also if not just in the in the chat, but I do see Yared's comment about uh, whether we've considered bringing a political economy lens to knowledge brokering. I think that's uh, definitely, uh, yeah, what is needed. Uh, uh, and that is also where we've been thinking about what skills uh, do knowledge brokers need. And I think one of them is definitely tied around uh, yeah, being able to understand one's uh, yeah context like the political economy. So uh, yes, and it will be great, Yara, to get more of your input as we as we get to that uh, point of uh, of thinking specifically about uh, yeah what training to to develop. I see also Guy uh, put a comment. Uh, uh, I think the building partnerships and supporting mechanisms. So, uh, um, yeah, again, uh, crucial role no, of knowledge brokers to, to build these partnerships, uh, but also, yes, the supporting mechanisms, like you were talking about multi-stakeholder governed trusts uh, uh, for more equitable management of resources. Lisa? Now, I'm, I'm going to try and uh, provide one potential <laughs> solution to the complexity, which is just building on Guy's point that, yeah, I think that I know I know it's touted a lot and it's quite um, mentioned a lot these days with like this radical collaboration idea that you, you to, to act at the systemic level, you have to have partnerships and collaborations between actors who don't normally work together in space mm -hmm. across disciplines, across you know different spaces. So I think not that it's it's a it's a it's a, a solution for for everything, but I think yeah, really really being serious about collaboration and then trying to build on what's already has momentum and whatever whatever what already has um is is creating change in a space and then again one has to understand the context in which to do that so you really have to understand what's the lever of change in this context and how can I, how can we work with this um but uh, yeah it's it is definitely not, we can't do it uh, alone um and no actor can do it alone mm. I see we have a question from Joseph. Uh, can we consider indigenous people as knowledge producers? And is a project proponent willing to uh, populate their traditional knowledge? Yeah, so I mean, most definitely, uh, this is one of the uh, knowledge uh, types or knowledge holders uh, that need to be brought to, to the table. There is, a, as we know, <laughs> like a, yeah, so much to be learned from, uh, the indigenous practices and yeah, the, the, all the solutions that are already there and that often are either ignored or uh, yeah, top-down responses come from outside. So I think that uh, definitely they they are knowledge producers. I think also they could be, or and in some cases they definitely are knowledge brokers in their own communities, uh, like where when they are uh, saying which measures or adaptation measures may may work better and so on um but uh yeah definitely a very uh, very relevant uh, actor and uh, knowledge the uh, type chris i see you're adding about uh, the fatigue of communities or yeah and uh and uh, 
yeah, it sounds quite uh, one way, no? If uh, you're mentioning about bombarding them with information. Um, and again, how can this process be more two-way? How can we be learning with these communities, uh, working with them rather than telling them this is what, uh, um, yeah, what is the right answer? I see Michelle is uh, is there to I'm sure to contribute also maybe about this question or. Hi, I'm just hi everybody. Um, I'm just going back to Joseph's point about and and the discussion about indigenous knowledge mm. and the and and indigenous people as knowledge brokers. I think also we've got to see um, indigenous knowledge and indigenous people as knowledge brokers to to us. Mm -hmm. So giving us the knowledge of the, you know, from, from, you know, hundreds of years of the, of the earth, of changes that are happening, of a different way of being. Um, and so, yeah, so I think that, so we are also on the receiving end by we, I mean, the kind of international climate change community and and are getting information and knowledge from indigenous people towards us as well. And I think we've got to recognize that as well. Thank you, Michelle, yeah, for that important addition. Um, I see we also have a comment from uh, Jacaria about uh, the word broker, which is uh, where we started that, uh, yes, we actually have heard in, that in Bangladesh, it's a very problematic word. We thought about it a lot, uh, like as we were doing our learning about knowledge brokering about this word, in the end, we found it very difficult to find a, a good um, a synonym. Uh, so the way for now we have opted is to, just put that disclaimer at the beginning where we recognize that as a term, it may be problematic, but we haven't really gone to, to change uh, yeah, the word knowledge broker because uh, many of the other words uh, I feel don't capture the variety, but I think it's a, this is a, still a discussion that uh, yeah, is not closed because uh, yeah, this type of feedback I think is, uh, is important for us to, to hear again. Yeah. I'm Lisa would uh, or yeah. Nadia? No, I just I see that Matteo um, uh, has shared a, ni a nice example of where um, they've attempted to broker the bridge between evidence and policy in Kenya and other African countries. So very thank you very much for sharing that. I don't know if you, if you want to to share any of that example with us. Um, if not, that's fine. <laughs> but it's always useful to to understand what's being done elsewhere. Oh, maybe you, Matthew, you will share with us. Yeah, sure. I can give a quick example. Uh, thank you, Lisa, for for the chance. So uh, I work for the Partnership for African Social and Governance Research in Africa, in, that is based in Kenya. And we have uh, a model that we call Utafiti Sera, and uh, it means many things. In Swahili, it means uh, research policy. And in, the, in our Utafiti Sera model, we try to bring all the diverse uh, stakeholders that are concerned with a particular issue uh, on one one setting, and we create we sort of try to create it as a safe uh, safe space for them. We first do stakeholder mapping to understand interests and motivations and all these things, and then we constitute uh, this Utopia Sierra House, and we anchor it in 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 one of the institutions of the people who, who of the stakeholders who are in, who are in this uh, Utafiti Sarah house. And here we try not only to look at the scientific knowledge that they have, but also the perfect knowledge. And we also uh, try to do policy culture studies uh, in our case for policy to identify which uh, cultures beyond scientific influence that this help or determine policymakers to make certain decisions. 
And so far, we have seen it to be quite successful. For example, in Kenya, uh, we have uh, we have we have brought on board, for example, one project on engineers who do not who build infrastructure without considering the social aspects of infrastructure. And now the engineers who build roads in Kenya have incorporated uh, a social aspect of building infrastructure. They have made a framework uh, that consider, considers social dimension of infrastructure and they have to, they now have to go to the people, uh, assess the impacts, for example, a road, a major infrastructure would have to them and so on. So uh, we are trying to make an impact with this. It's not always linear. It's very, it's a very murky process that requires a lot of emotional intelligence for all the people involved, but at least we are seeing some results. Uh, if you can uh, follow the link to get more examples of what we have been doing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was a uh, yeah really fascinating to hear about that work and um, yeah definitely something that we would uh, want to learn more. So thank you so much for sharing and also for uh, the link. I'm sure many of us will go and check. Um, Nadia, I know that you had your hand up before. Did you uh, did you want to come in? Um, it was just to ask, I guess, that question. So if people had um, experience of processes uh, that work really well, um, and so I think, you know, if some of that's already been answered, and it's wonderful to have this resource. And I just wondered if others could also share in the mm. chat. I think it's so lovely to hear what has worked in different contexts and some of the challenges. Um, and, and, and I think for me, um, trying to understand some kind of innovative ways of running processes. So, so that is, and, and something we've been experimenting recently with is around immersive experiences. So how do you bring kind of people's whole beings into the learning process so they can learn kind of with all their senses and using arts-based practices to try and unlock kind of new horizons and imaginaries for, for trying to understand different experiences and um, different knowledge, different perceptions. Um, and I just wondered if others had experience of, of things that they've used where there was kind of an aha moment in a group, because sometimes, you, you know, it's a, you, people are nodding and people are smiling, but there's not that spark that happens. And I just wondered if, if people had those examples of, of what unlocked those, those, that sparkiness to happen. Mm, yeah, indeed, that would be great if uh, if anybody else can uh, can contribute uh, either on the chat or otherwise uh, we're open to have uh, follow up conversations. So uh, you can write to any of us, but uh, that would be great. Um, I also saw that Edmund had asked, uh, I wonder how knowledge brokers can support transformation processes uh, with communities that are dealing with limits like institutional challenges that are hard to change. And uh, I think, yeah, this is a, these uh, like change processes that really I think knowledge brokers need to uh, need to facilitate. And I think it goes back to Chris's point earlier that they are really should be catalysts, uh, knowledge brokers of processes, uh, so that uh, uh, these uh, dialogues uh, can begin between uh, all the relevant stakeholders uh, that uh, yeah, have a stake in the issue that maybe, for example, land issues. Although, of course, we yeah, we cannot be naive, no? Once again, we know that there are power dynamics at play, that probably there are people who don't want to, like, uh, for example, land tenure issues to change. And yet, uh, I think that is where the innovation brokering comes in and where there is a real need to shake systems and to at least start exploring these very difficult conversations and building trust, which once again, we cannot be naive about it. It's not something that will, will happen easily, but to uh, yeah, start to uh, at least to trigger some of these different conversations that are needed and processes where people can be brought together and then exploring also what type of maybe incentive structures like could we be looking at things differently but once again the more stakeholders and knowledge types you bring together the easier it is that through this collective uh, knowledge and dialogue uh, perhaps we can explore uh, ways to uh, yeah 
to change uh, structures that are not working well. But uh, yeah, I, I yeah I think we really we do recognize the challenges, but uh, yet it's it's what is uh, what is needed. Um, Yes, and that ties a little bit also to Chris's addition around the issue of voice and power. Um, and of course, uh, who has the strongest voice is not uh, who maybe represents uh, like the yeah marginalized interests. So, so uh, um, and I think that's where also knowledge brokers need these tools. Uh, Chris, you're saying we need to give voice to the group without creating social tension. So once again, I think uh, when we talk about uh, using different tools to surface perhaps power dynamics, I think we also have to be very cognizant about not making things worse because sometimes, of course, we don't want to, uh, uh, like there has to be a space which is safe for, for everyone. And in some cases it, uh, it will definitely not be. And perhaps the surfacing of the power differences will make things worse. So I think that's also where knowledge brokers, I yeah, need to really be able to navigate these spaces very carefully and once again, not be naive just about how how complex it is as soon as we, we bring these uh, different voices together. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Our form seems not to be working. I will yes. unlock it. Great. Sorry about that, everyone. We'll sort it out right now. Yes. Um, I don't know, Lisa, if um, I see we have two minutes left. I wonder if we may want to be uh, um, wrapping up <laughs> or yeah. uh, are there any last uh, words uh, of wisdom from anyone or from you? Any, any, any other burning issues that anyone wants to raise? Okay, great. Well, well, thank you very, very much uh, for joining us here today. It was really, um, this is this is a wonderful uh, space where we can really sort of share our challenges and 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 really get to grips with the, the 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 very important role that knowledge brokers play and how you know how difficult the challenge is and how we might be able to come, overcome some of these barriers. So we we do we do we 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 can share our information our our. Um, email address in the chat and we really are open to if you have any if you haven't any examples that you would like to share through cdcan channels we have a very active blog program um if you want to share if any any articles with us or any any um you want to write a blog for the for the cdcan website we're always very open to that so do get in touch um and we we also hope to be able to like take this work forward um and take these insights and these learnings forward and 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 think about how we might uh, work together collectively to 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 better equip ourselves and and on being more effective and uh, thank you much for what you do keep in touch there's our email address for anyone who wants to share an, a, an effective example of knowledge brokering. Yeah, thank you again, everyone. Bye, all the best. Bye, thank, thank you. you.